Because, you know, there'll be a quick burger at the, um, not called the program manager for well, writing and reading center, which probably the writing and reading center is a long time. My office is straight down the hall, mostly the other student writing center there, but they also help out with the academic literacy center, um, which is over in the TV building and hopefully soon to be also over in South City. Um, uh, and the reason we're doing this workshop on ASL and, and English um, is because we actually got a fancy grant from, what's it called, Melissa? The grant? Universal Access Grant, and we got a bunch of, of texts from Gallaudet University Press, um, specifically working um, with uh, the deaf and their writing. Um, and I'll tag them around and you can take a look at them. They are available for checkout and use from the Student Writing Center Library. Um, if you're interested, there's a, there's a wide range of things. It's not just about writing, there's also about um, discourse in, in um, the deaf community and ESL particularly. Um, it's really cool though because um, it, it goes into spaces, literally spaces that the traditional, um, our traditional study of, of rhetoric and discourse doesn't go to in physical, actual physical space and about talking and designing and that sort of thing. So it's really pretty cool. Uh, but there's also some work, some text on um, working specifically with um, uh, writers who are deaf. And, and that's part of the reason to have this workshop is to, to let you know that these are available for your use and, and study. So I'll hand them around in a second. Um, but I'm just going to turn the time over to Jody and Dwayne, who are here to um, talk about ASL and English. So thank you. Oh, and I've got to sign up list here. You can put your name on it. Those of you who are adjunct will get paid. Good work. Uh, tutors will also get paid. Hi, well, I'm Jody. This is my husband, Dwayne. It's obvious that we're married. I mean, our last names are the same. But I asked him to join. Uh, he is a full time instructor here. He was born deaf, uh, raised with a deaf family. And so I thought that it would be great for him to come and give his perspective as well. Um, I grew up in a hearing family, which means a family that could hear. Um, until I was 19, I was taught to speak. And so we both have a different background. So uh, kind of a different ba uh, balance to give you different perspectives. And I work in the DRC, the Disability Resource Center. And I've worked there for four. Fourteen years? Yeah, fourteen years. A long time. And we're married. We have two deaf children as well. And they're both in middle school. And they go to a school in Salt Lake City. So, let's get started. So, I want you to know that this is a safe zone. You can ask us any questions. We're not going to be offended. There's no stupid questions in here. If you've ever had a burning question or you're just curious about something, just let us know. And um, feel free to interrupt at any time if you have any questions. Um, and this is a casual presentation. Oh, um, before, and before Dwayne explains the difference between ASL and English, I'm going to talk more about the history of ASL so you kind of understand the background of it. Before, you're, before you can really understand the difference between the two, you kind of need to have a background. So first question, kind of a warm up. So, so historically, American Sign Language is related to what language? What do you think? A, B, C, or D? A, A. A. C. C. <laughs> the real answer, it is C. It's, it is French. You'd think that it would be British because, I mean, we speak the same language, but it's not. And Dwayne knows more. Well, Dwayne served a mission for the LDS Church in England and, and Scotland, and they use British Sign Language, which is different than American Sign Language. Very different. There's nothing similar. If you try to, to look to compare them, you find nothing similar. French is about 40% similar to ASL.
at that time there was a lot of home signs. Uh, people would have small communities of deaf people, so they might do that and people would get together. So this was the first time they were able to kind of combine that and that helped evolve the language as well. So this is the current picture of Colorado University. Both of us graduated from there. Um, the man that we just saw the picture of uh, right there, um, the name was, the university was named after him. So just thought I'd let you know. It's in Washington, D.C. So this is kind of the sign language family line. I uh, got it from Facebook. I'm not sure exactly how air accurate it is, but it seems pretty right. Um, you can see um, American Sign Language. It's not the exact same as the French, but it's kind of a sister to it. And then under that is BSL, um, Arab Sign Language, Chinese, Japanese, British. They're all different. A lot of people think that ASL is a universal language. It's not. Every country pretty much has their own sign language. I mean, if you go to Mexico, their sign language would be totally different than ours. Same with any other country. So, uh, to, you could communicate with gestures with them, but you wouldn't be able to use the actual language. Um, my dad was in the military, and he went to Hong Kong, and they, so he assumed that uh, all sign language was the same. But he was in Hong Kong and he met a deaf family and I had no idea what they were saying. And I couldn't communicate with them. I mean, I could gesture with him and get the point across. And that's when my dad first realized that uh, sign language is not universal. I want to add an example. So like British Sign Language, here you've probably seen our alphabet, we spell in one hand. And in England it's two hands, so this is an example. Here. So that was the whole alphabet. So quite different. So my name, Wayne, there would be that. So a little bit different, I mean completely different there. If the first time you see it, there's no way you can guess it. It's, it's so foreign, it's all new. So this is another man, his name is Dr. William Stokey. His name sign is uh, a hat on the head. And he did not invent sign language. He is the father of ASL linguistics. He studied the linguistics of ASL and uh, really uh, wrote that. He was hired as an English teacher. He it can hear, so he is not deaf. A lot of people would assume he is, but he's not. He was hired by the Gallaudet University to English department to teach English in 1955. He, didn't know sign language. He had never been exposed to sign language, never been exposed to the deaf community or the deaf culture. But he was hired to, to work at this deaf university. And it was, at that time, they used something called manual communication. It was signs, but in English word order. And so that's what he was learning. But then when he went to teach, he realized that the deaf students weren't signing that. It was more net natural, more native. And so he was very confused what the difference was between, the, between this manual sign and what he was seeing. And he started researching it and realized what they were using was an actual language. And back, what, back in the day, um, it was, I think it was called coded ASL. Is that right, Wayne? It's an ASL. I think they just called it like English Sign, whatever. So yeah, um, it was back then. It was called English Sign Language, but then Stokey realized that it was that ASL has is a language, and he studied while he was studying ASL. Gallaudet was very critical of his studies, and but he was determined to show them that uh, it is a language. This is one of my favorite things. This was uh, I saw in college. When I was in <coughs> so go ahead and this. It's a dialogue between a deaf colleague and Stokey. And this deaf teacher um, did not believe Stokey that ASL was a language. Because at that time, uh, signing was considered broken English or gestures or a lower language. So it was kind of embarrassing. 
embarrassing to use it. But Stokey was trying to show people that no, it's not broken English. It's not a lower language. It is a language all on its own. And even the deaf professors were not, didn't believe him. So I, through this, you can see that he's trying to show him that it is a language, but the, the deaf colleague was trying to say, no, it's not. So you know, the, wait a minute, let me show you. What we use is like this. Hey, Gil, I would like to take you out for a drink. How about it? That's English. You sign it word for word. We would sign it. And you know, he's, yeah, I know. Then, you know, I don't like to use, I like this. Me think car ride expensive. It's not English. But it's sign language. It's ASL. And the deaf colleague would, no, no, it's not. It's a lower language. And so it's, no, it's not a lower language. You don't get, understand. You're stubborn, always you. It's, and then so he said, see, you're using ASL. And the deaf colleague, no, I never use ASL. He says, oh, I didn't get it. So I, luckily, Stokey was very stubborn as well. He pushed to get this research published and, and done. And it's a good thing because now it's recognized as a language. I mean, that he, this is groundbreaking research. And he proved that ASL is a language, that it has structure, it has grammar. Now, back up just a little bit. I want to talk about how he studied ASL. Um, when he was working on his PhD, uh, his research focused on Old and Middle English. Uh, I wasn't sure what that meant. I mean, I know that Shakespeare is Old English, but I wasn't exactly sure what that all meant until I looked at this website, and it shows uh, these vowel changes between Old and Middle English. So it's kind of this concept, and this is how Stokey uh, did his research. He was using this kind of system from Middle English, and he wanted to study ASL. And so he came up with this written notation for ASL. So the, the notation is similar to the Old English, Middle English writings. Well, I'll just point out that I don't even understand this. I, I have no clue what most of this is. But he was trying to make symbols to show like what your handshapes would be. You know, is it a bent C? Is it a flat B kind of handshape? And then he was also trying to represent movement as well as location. Know where each of those are located in your body. And I don't know what they mean specifically, but I, there's two little examples there to kind of give you an idea of what it might look like to do the same thing. Yes. There's Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And then you can see the quotes here. Oh, like that quote. You can kind of see how it's shown up above. You know, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but uh, three. So the way maybe that's indicating what which direction the palm is oriented. You know, maybe it's towards the body or away from it. So for bear, this I can sign bear, gosh, you know, obviously a lot of notation just to show the placement of all of those. So he would use that way, he could study it more specifically because he could start noticing the rules for things because he could document it. Okay, and this was mostly used by linguistics. I mean, most of a, the everyday deaf person would not know how to use this notation. But this is how Stokey was proving that ASL is a language. I mean, after his studies, um, it was proven that ASL has syntax, <coughs> rules, grammatical sentence structures, and it is a language. So uh, it's a natural visual language. And it, it is capable of expressing abstract ideas. Did you want to add your your example, Dwayne, about abstract ideas? Sure. So like gestures, people think it's gesturing, but that's quite limited. You can't talk about in-depth thing, you know, God and religion. It's all about body motion. But with language, you can actually talk about any topic. You can talk about the sciences or history or politics or those things that you can't do with a gesture. Uses space. Yeah, it uses space to represent meaning. 
as well. So we actually have perfect examples. That's what's happening right now. So right now, ASL is the fourth most free used language in the United States and Canada. And it's, it's a human right to use sign language. It's not just an option. There's a lot of people that think that signing is wrong, that deaf people should not learn sign, that, it's, they, that they want to take away our language. But no, we value it. It's our right to communication access. And now I'm going to turn the time over to Dwayne to talk more about the difference between the ASL and English. So we've, there's a couple of things we can compare between ASL and English. So for example, English uses one word for the word run. You know, and there's so many different meanings for that single word, but it all sounds the same with run. But in sign, you have different ways of signing each of those. So for each of these examples, you know, what does it mean? He runs like he's physically moving through space. It's signed like this. You know, you can also use facial expressions to, to show meaning. So you could like a short, a short jog, you have this casual facial expressions. You know, if you can piece the facial expression then he's really running, you know, he's, he's in a hurry, he's trying to get somewhere. Or you say he's just a modern run. Um, also, there's timing in that too. Like you could show if they was running short, or the exaggerated facial expression can show that he's been running for a long time. You know, whether he's going somewhere short, or he's got some place really far to go to. Uh, the water is running. You wouldn't use that same sign. That's different. You'd show the water as it's falling out of the faucet. You know, so this is, this is running. So you can turn the water on if you get it, and you do this for the run. Um, trying to think. You could show a difference, I suppose. If you have a big amount of water running, you could sign that differently, but basically up and down like that. The engine's running, you show engine, and you can see it in motion, it wiggles. So like, leave the engine running for three minutes, let it warm up, you know, check the oil and whatnot. But if there's your moving engine. I better run. It doesn't mean I have to actually run, it just means I need to leave. So better something like, I need to go, or I need to take off, and you sign like this. And then, who will run the meeting? So this kind of sign here, meaning you control the meeting, doesn't mean you're running around in the room, it means you're directing it, so control. The dog chases after the rotor, really, is what that means, right? So you can show that they're actually chasing behind someone. You know, you can alter that a little bit. She runs into an old friend. Oh, this is my old friend and I ran into her. Well, literally, inside me, you ran into so, you know, you can't use the word run with your feet for all of these meanings. So, in English, we know that there's different meanings and we figure out what that is, but there's actually different signs for each of those. So, ASL structure, here's an example. Me hungry, want to eat. And make that a question. With a facial expression, it has the meaning. You can make that a yes or no question. You can't just say, me hungry, no, if I to add that facial expression, now I'm asking you, do you want to eat? And then, yes, here's the English version, so you see that. Yesterday meaning boring. So you could emphasize that. It could be a little bit boring or really boring, right? Depending on the facial expression, the size and motion that you're using. So there's little boring, there's really boring. You know, add emphasis, really boring. So notice with uh, ASL, there's a lot of uh, following with time first, in terms of sentence order. There is some flexibility, you can move things around, but typically time first. So in English, I know that's usually last. So like, I'll see you tomorrow night, right? Night's the last thing you say. I'm like, tomorrow night, I'll see you. You could say that in English, but typically you don't. And uh, so ASL is typically the opposite. You say time first most of the time. So like yesterday, that means born. So yeah, just give me a second to look at that first. So yesterday happened awful. Car came in, boy in front, big accident was thrown off to the side. So you can show this happening, representing the car and the person and show that. You know. Obviously, it's not the same word we're using these two things, but you can convey it to me. Also, 
also using space. English doesn't have it. You've got to use a lot of words, right? How things sound and how things are written. ASL uses space to represent a lot of things. It can have a lot of meanings for the time for spaces. So, for example, pronouns. Um, you guys are very emphasize very much on the he, she, they, you know, and it doesn't make sense without those. You don't know who you're talking about. You must include that pronoun. And ASL uses space to represent the same thing. So when you first start talking, you have to identify what you're talking about. So we're talking about a man, and then I'll point to this imaginary man, and then I've created this person that we'll re refer to in the future. So like, I'm at a house, his house here. You know, so I'm pointing to him. That's my pronoun. I'm not actually using the word he, his house, but I'll show the object, but I'll represent it in space and use that space I made up for him as a reference. Um, and in English, you know, you've got to have the word. So that's one of the differences. So often, a lot of times, deaf people might struggle using those pronouns, or they might confuse them. Or, you know, like when is appropriate to use them and how they're used together, and that that might throw them off. Um, it also works for things too. I can talk about a cat, a dog, and you know, point to those and reference in space. You know, save that cat, and then refer to it in the future. It's so cute by pointing to that space I created. Um, so references, you can set, you can make these references you set around your body. So when I say like she says, and he said such and such, well I do that by pointing. She said to my right, and he said to my left. Or uh, maybe I've got three people. I can set up three different areas of space. So maybe we've got the dog, the cat, and the horse I'm representing, and I can point to each of those as I'm commenting about them. Or maybe I've got, uh, you know, even with the space, sometimes I can move that around, and I'm, I'm using a lot of space. English is so rigid, you've got all these words you've got to follow. <laughs> okay, verb agreement. So really it depends on where things are set up and work kind of the same way. So if I've got a paper, that's directional. So you give me the paper, that's, you know, I'm moving toward myself. He gives that paper to her, I'm showing that the movement happening between two other people. So you've got to add those words, the he and the she, you know, and sometimes you've got to add that feminine. And, uh, you know, my, I might say the girl, a mother, and then show, give me that the girl loves the mother. And then the mother hands it to someone else and hands it to me. So I'm showing what's happening. Even in the word show, I can show towards someone or they can show me. So those pronouns are represented in space they have to do, but it's not necessarily the word that we're using. Uh, recently we were just saying, like, she says, he says, and trying to keep that straight. straight. Um, you know, we don't want to say the man says or she says. ASL doesn't quite have that. Um, so we often show things like that with world shifting. So for example, we've got these two references we've set up on either side. Well, we can then take on the role of the person who's saying that. So if I shift, I now become that person in that position or become the person in that other position. And that might depend on my eye contact. So for example, I'll show a boy, point here to my left, and he moves up to his father, and now look, I'm the son. I'll look up at my dad with the facial expression and say, hey, dad. So I'm now representing what the boy would look like if he's looking up to his dad. And then I'll show the dad looking down at the sign. So I'm now the father of role, looking at him now and to show the kid's reaction. So my kind of role shifting there, my, the direction I'm looking and the way I shift my body, I'm actually representing those two that. That counts for the preposition for them. Um, but it's great because you can use the space. You can also, uh, the way we show agreement is by uh, making that eye contact and have that match up with what we set up originally in the space. Comparative structures, uh, say I'm talking about a Ford and a Chevy. So I can set those up in space and have to remember now, Chevys are on my right, Fords are on my left. And you know, I can talk how they're the same price. This sign here shows the comparison. I'm pointing to both of them. But then I can maybe say, <clears throat> as I buy this, the value goes down. But here I buy it, the value goes up. But where I sign the value goes down, where the value goes up, uh, is, is referring to the things I said before. Even if I were to show like a sliding scale, I could show one thing going up, one going down, but that my left hand is now representing Ford and the right hand is representing Chevy. I just need to remember that. 
Um, there's also classifiers. So you can represent a car by putting your handshape up like this. You can represent a person like this. Looks like they're standing there. But this could also mean, um, you know, bicycle or something. You can make a representation of an airplane here. Make a representation of a chair. You can see it kind of looks somewhat like a chair. So depending on the shape of an object, the table, you might have a flat hand that could represent your table. So there's a couple of different shapes that you can use as classifiers to represent these different objects. <coughs> so for example, you might see a sentence something like, the boy is behind the car. One sign language, you know, well again, you're focusing on every word that with English, and they're all important to understand where you're at. But in ASL, you use a classifier. So I would show car and the boy here. Now you can see that the boy's standing inside the car. So from my view, it's behind the car, right? From my eyes, where I can show the car and he's basically standing by me. Or in front of her, the side, it depends, right? All just where you place the hand. Um, so if you've got the boy, you can have him show him standing on the car. That's why you're starting to face him. Where is the boy in front of the car? So it's just a simple show where it takes the English words to it. Um, English that is very dependent on prepositions. Uh, showing under, on, behind, representing where things, the action is taking place. So in our English example here, uh, put my bag under the desk in front of the chair. But in ASL I would show desk, and then I'd say bag, and then I'd point to where it's at in, re in reference to that table. So I've said the word, and now point where it's at. So I could show point here on the ground, point behind it, point beside it, on the other side of it. So it's done really quickly, but it represents the same meaning. So interesting, uh, like with English, we would tend to say first, the fig figure comes first, and then the figure comes second. So, and so you can't say the table is under the cup. You know, something like that would be really strange. You have to say that the cup is on the table, right? But uh, in ASL, uh, it doesn't really matter. You can represent the table and then show cups sitting on top of it. So I do table first, cup, and then set the cup on top. You know, so it's a little bit opposite there. So often you guys, as you're speaking, it might be a little confusing. If, whose view are we talking about? And, you know, it, is Ben's to the right of the, his wife, who's to the left? Like, wait, whose perspective are we talking about here? And in ASL, it's very visual and it's spatial, so it's very clear who's talking. So, um, so we use that to convey the spatial relationship or the service view. So I can show that other person's view. So for example, you guys see the interpreters, and this is how, well, the way you might represent it is like this. I show the two people sitting. So, so you show two people sitting, it looks like they're sitting behind that sitting hand position, right? But my view, I would say like this, it's just the opposite, right? Because they're facing towards me. And so that's clear, I don't need to describe where they are, who they are, who's saying what. I can just show which direction they're facing based off of my vision. And I don't have to think, wait, your right versus my left of the, I, you know, get confused with the spatial relationship. So this was a little experiment, comparing how much it takes to describe a dollhouse in English, describing how much it might take in sign language. So it, you can see the difference that it might take. So the left column here is English, and the right column is ASL. So. Anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, also ASL. A lot of deaf people enjoy ASL because it's really more like watching the cinema. You know, it's enjoyable. So you guys might like an enjoyable story because it paints a picture. But with ASL, you really can show the picture. It's very visual. So you get a lot closer to cinema type action. So uh, a little clip here.
enough. So now you've got the picture there. Now if I use ASL to describe that using those classifiers, using the space, so I can show two men that are represented. Now I point to the one and I show him the other, the other guy who's controlling the engine, right? So you show the boat and it's rocking and the waves coming up and then you see this huge wave coming up, 50, 60, 70 feet tall coming towards the boat. They get scared, Hub's like, gun it, and so he guns it and the engine's revving and the boat's moving forward and this giant wave comes up towards them and they start climbing it and they're screaming at each other and it's too late. It's already to the point where the boat, they put the top of the back. Right? So, um, so the English versus ASL, not always close. Sometimes people think that signing is just English on the hands, right? You can sign that way, you can sign it, but it's really not natural. You know, a man is behind that bar. That's just not a natural way of signing it. But everyday natural language use, people will be using the space, they'll be using the facial expressions, they'll be using the meaning and, and, and putting it all together. So, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So, with sign language being very visual, putting it all together has the meaning of a thousand points of grammar. Anyway, back to my <clears throat> So, now I love history. So I want to kind of, I gave you a little bit of that, then he was talking about English. Now, I want to talk about language acquisition and how that uh, impacts our deaf and hard of hearing students and how they can improve their writing here at the college. So, <clears throat> Have any of you heard of VIX or CALP before? Basic interpersonal communication skills and cognitive academic language proficiency. Do you want me to explain that? Um, so VIX, really it's kind of the same as you could say with any language, in Spanish or English. Or, um, but basically VIX means when you start with language at home. So what you do communicating with your parents, your daily communication, the things you learn there, the right and wrongs, just the things you start to incorporate, right? You know, you pick up things from listening to TV. Uh, you pick up from listening from your friends, your neighbors, your parents. So the everyday language that you pick up is these bigs, right? And then the next part, these helps, is more academic. So by the time you get into school, you know, the way you learn things you talk is a little more advanced level. So it's the same language, you're both talking English, but there's more of that academic, let's see, or say in Spanish, you know, they've got, you know, some things that are similarity, like, so maybe you'll speak Spanish at home, but then by the time you get in school, you realize things are a little bit different. Um, and that might be one of the problems that second language, second language learners are really struggling. They might be able to communicate casually, but by the time you get to academics, it's hard. So deaf persons, you know, people vary too. With uh, Bix, uh, you know, if typically a deaf person won't have hearing impairments, right? So then they won't have the language exposure. They won't see it, they won't pick it up incidentally, so they don't have these Bix. So you need that foundation before you start in school. So when they get to school and they're presenting things at this CALP level, but they don't even have the Bix basics, then uh, it's hard. So the language exposure is really important because You've got to have that foundation so that you're ready before you even enter school. You know, um, in, in sign language, the CALPs might be more of the English order signing, it'll be more specific, but that might not make sense if you're really new to it and you don't have the basis of a strong ASL background. Um, so same thing with English speaking, it's just, you need that foundation before you can enter the Right, and so California just passed a law, it's Senate Bill 210, and did you get my email about that one? Yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. And the law was just passed in November of 2015. <clears throat> and the purpose of the law is to make sure that all deaf and hard of hearing children have language, are language ready before they enter kindergarten. So they have a system set up that, so if a child is born and is identified as deaf or hard of hearing, every six months they have an assessment to make sure that they are, they are getting the fix before they get to school. So then they're, when they get to kindergarten, they're ready for the CALP. And California is encouraging all 49 other states to, in, to get this law, and I really hope that Utah will adopt this law. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Interesting. That's 
California. <laughs> we would have less problems here. Because I mean, a lot of our students graduate from high school and they're not ready for college. And we don't really have a lot of options to help them get ready for college. So I think if we had this kind of a law in place, it would help. And these are, this is a recent stat that was uh, put out in 2015. Um, it's from the National Association of the Deaf. I'm a member of that organization, and this was in their recent newsletter. And right now, there are 96% of deaf and hard of hearing children are born to hearing parents. And 71.6% of those family members do not regularly work with their deaf and hard of hearing children. And that impacts their language acquisition. So that's why they don't have those VICs when they get to be school age. Uh, I want to add, it's not just the VIX, but also it's really sad. With the CALPS, you know, it's not typically equivalent. So, for example, teachers might be learning, um, you know, might spend some time in college and take an ASL class, maybe they've only had a couple classes, and then they start going on with their other courses. So, you know, if they're teaching deaf children, you know, they don't have the proficiency in the language, so that causes a problem as well. And I love this picture. It's a, the greatest irony right now. We, there's a hearing baby and a deaf baby. You know, ASL is becoming very popular to teach to babies right now. You know, milk, mom, more. It helps li limit their tantrums. So they, you know, it's been proven that a baby can learn sign before they can talk. But it's interesting that, you know, for that situation, their parents are willing to do that. But if it's a deaf baby, they want, they're, they're told don't sign with them. Mm -hmm. They take them to an audiologist, fix them, give them cochlear implants. So it's kind of interesting the irony in our world because 96% of parents that, ha well, 96% of deaf and hard of hearing children have hearing parents, and they're not exposed to sign language, most of them, so it's interesting how it uh, impacts their social, uh, everything in their life. I uh, just want to add, it's nice to see, just get a little glimpse of how early childhood communication can have an impact, seeing this fix in this house, it's really important, so I just wanted to show a little this is like two minutes.
So, you know, think that the fix and the calps, how easy that makes them to transition. When they're able to communicate like this, how much easier it is to then go on and talk about more academic subjects and, and be able to do so more readily. Deaf children that have deaf parents are, have, historically have better academic scores and better social skills than deaf children born to hearing parents. And that's been proven over and over again with research and statistics. And it's our education system is set up to be an ASL English bilingual that gives the children opportunity to learn two languages as, at the same time, to learn ASL and also to read and write English. We uh, both have, we, as I said before, we have uh, two deaf children and they are going to school in this ASL English bilingual system. And you can see this uh, thing at the bottom and it was uh, invented by a, a deaf professor from Gallaudet. And you know this video we just showed you that they're three and four years old and signing in a classroom. That is social ASL. So it, that gives them the foundation, the linguistic, the language knowledge. And then when they're ready to transfer into that academic ASL, uh, that's when you know you throw in your social sciences, your math, all of that. And then that will easily transfer into social English. You know, when you throw in English word order, vocabulary, sentence English sentence structure. And when they are when they're starting to pick that up, then they can go into academic English. So it's this transition thing through K through twelve. I mean, if you think about it, the children of the deaf children of hearing parents don't have the social ASL or the academic ASL before they go to school. They don't even have the social English. So when they get to, to school, they're confronted with academic English and they have no background. So it's instead of a, you know, they have no option to sink or swim, it's sink. You know, sometimes they do have the basics, but then they'll come in and they, the teacher doesn't have it. Maybe they learns a little bit and they only know some English, they don't know the true points of ASL and, and still miss it even though they've got some basics. So hopefully this gives you kind of a better idea of how the, our deaf and hard of, hearing, hard of hearing students have been struggling. And 70% of deaf and hard of hearing students are mainstream which means they go to a public school and they, they struggle with school because of the, lang the lack of language structure since they were young. And I mean, here children, they start picking up language, <coughs> and vocabulary, and linguistics, and everything from birth. But if a deaf child of hearing parents, they don't get anything, they don't hear the R, is, the, ands, and so then trying to apply that to reading, it, it, it hurts them. So, I mean, now that they're in school and have to, do, to uh, write uh, college papers and succeed at a college level, it's harder for them. I mean, a lot of students only hear grades, are taught grammar in kindergarten to first grade. And then from then on, Grammar itself is not taught. It's just expected to pick it up. So, and I mean, English, ASL hearing students can hear a new word and then try to figure it out on their own or ask, ask a teacher. But if, if you've never seen a word or been exposed to it, it's kind of harder for the deaf and hard of hearing. And a lot of deaf students have been pitied or handheld all the way through, through school. And it, kind of ruins them. They need to have more of a tough love experience so that they do have to learn. Some of them, I mean, I'm sure some of you have encountered it where this is the first paper a deaf student's had to write. I mean, they can sign it to you, they can tell you what they want to say, but trying to get it into English is really hard. Like my children, their first language is <coughs> And so when they, in school, 
try to write uh, papers they struggle with is and are. And so we try to teach them to put it back in. So I mean, having the social ASL and the academic ASL and then the social English and the academic English is very important. Oh, sorry, I went too far. There it is. Right now, my kids are in, uh, probably at the social English stage. They're in middle school right now. And we're trying to push them to get to the academic English stage before they finish high school. So it is a hard uh, transition, but parents need to be involved in this. So as I said before, the first time you deaf and hard hearing students write an English paper, they're going to struggle with it. And I've been here for quite a long time, and I, the deaf students will take uh, their English right <coughs> placement test, and then they get an LELP score. A lot of them are put in uh, into reading 900, but they score below that. And so trying to figure out how to get them to that level. In the past, we did offer an, a deaf English class. It was DE 910. But we stopped it in 2006, 2007, right about the time that the, eco the economy crashed and all of the budget cuts happened. So, but it hasn't come back since then. I would love to see those students that score below the reading 900 uh, to go into an ESL class. They've, we've actually had some do that, go into an ESL grammar, so that they can improve their grammar and their vocabulary before they get into their reading and writing. So that then they can be more successful when they do get into those classes. Anything you wanted to add, Helene? So now, it's you any questions? Please answer. Oh well, please ask. I will answer. Um, <laughs> and this is, this quote is pretty true. It is a problem uh, and a big concern for us that that our students need to learn to read. Did anyone have questions? Yeah, this is completely not based on education. It's just completely out of curiosity. Do deaf children have what we call baby talk? Are there, you know, does it seem unformed? Or, um, they're practicing sign language. Right? And they may make mistakes or do silly things in sign language. I'm just really mm -hmm. curious. Yeah. Um, like babbling? There's the same thing with signs. You know, it might not be hand shapes, not done correctly. So, you know, maybe when you're one years old or something, <laughs> maybe nine, ten months, we'll start with like, well, milk, you know. You know, so this might be inside milk, but they might kind of do this loose thing. And, you know, so they'll, they'll start approximating the signs. Here's cookie. Maybe they'll do cookie here with one finger. So the, to get this claw shape might be hard for them. So they might have a different form of it. You know, mom, instead of a big hand on your chin, they'll do one finger. Instead of dad up here, they'll hit their head, you know, like, so palm orientation, they might mix up. So, yes, they start doing it and then it alters the form. So the kids are cute, you know, so they know that you're speaking. <laughs> yep. nice I think just having that exposure you know so it's fast though but I, it's it's passive learning you know so you can easily get by without learning a lot from it you just have to go by to truly learn it have it set in is a little bit harder but I think a lot of times people struggle because they have none of that background knowledge so even if those words are shown up on the screen they need to miss where it's at or how it's going so um, I think you can learn a lot and I think it is helpful and but reading is also one
got the heart right. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you guys remember how you started to read? Remember what it was like when you first started? It just kind of became natural. And then you look back and like, well, geez, how did I do that? You know, it just, it just kind of evolved naturally as I heard it. And I think kind of the same way with me. I, I don't quite remember how it started. I had teachers. We went through drills. We had repetition and conversation. And, you know, I, I think it all just kind of adds on to it. So I can't say exactly, you know, what the perfect way is or what's the right approach. I, I don't really remember where I started, but. Yeah, it's interesting that he doesn't know, because it was natural for him. It was, he grew up in a deaf family, deaf community, and while mine growing up was totally different, um, when I started reading, I had no language background at all. I had no bics. I learned uh, to read at 11. My parents tried to talk me before then, but I struggled. I couldn't hear them. There, there, there was no meaning to the words to me. I didn't have the language structure there, so I, I rebelled a bit. Until I was 11, I realized that reading was important. And so then I, I was a self-taught reader. I sat down and, and just taught myself because I knew I needed to survive in an English world. And I didn't want to miss out on it. So, yeah, our experience was were different. I think uh, yeah, if something gets you, you find a book or something that first gets you interested, and that can help you learn, you know, once you got that draw, you know, for you, you had something that... Yeah, you for me, it was Anne of Green Gables. That got me. I was 13, and one of my friends was taking an English class, and the book they were reading was Anne of Green Gables. I wasn't in, the, in that class, but she told me all about the books, and I was fascinated. And I watched the movies, you know, in the 80s, and I loved the main character. She was intelligent, imaginative, and I saw myself similar to her. And so that was one of the reasons that I decided to change my life. And really, I think that's one of the reasons that I am who I am today. I think I have a class coming in right now. So. But thank you very much. It was wonderful. And if you're interested, as I said earlier, I love history. There's actually a Utah Deaf History website. If you're interested, you can look at it on your own time. Yeah, and I'm sure if anyone has questions, both Joanne both and Jody work here, and they, I'm sure they'll probably be happy. I'm volunteering here, if you don't mind yeah. answering questions. It's true. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and thank, thank you for inviting us to come. Yeah, we'd love to do it again, too.